empty day by his grace. I thank him so much that he has given us a day like this and an opportunity to look into his word at such a time as this. And I also want to thank you for tuning in and making yourself available and for you being consistent in studying the word of God together with me. And I do believe by the grace of God that God is speaking to you as he is speaking to me. And there's something or some light that has been shared in your path concerning your daily walk with God. So why don't we pray today as we enter into uh, uh, chapters number 28 and chapter number 29, our reading of the day. Father, how glorious and excellent is your name. We are highly honored and highly favored that you've chosen to call us your own. Your word has decreed that you came to your own and your own received you not. But as to many as have believed you, you gave them the power to become the sons of God. It is an honor and a privilege, Lord, to be called your children. Above all also, Lord, it is just an honor to have your holy writ at our you know, dispose, just to read it. And to hear what you have to say. There's a lot of treasure that is hidden in your word. It is my prayer. It is my desire. That you shall unveil this through the power of the Holy Spirit. And make your word come alive in our hearts. We thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name. Let us pray and believe it. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter number 28 verses 1. Now, the Lord tells Moses, Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, and uh, the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Athamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make that they may make Aaron's garment to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as who as priest. And these are the garments which they shall make: a breastplate, an ephod, a robe a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a shash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to me as a priest. Now, a couple of issues rise here. The Lord speaks to Moses and he tells Moses, I want you to set aside Aaron and his sons. It means a consecration. Are set apart. God uses the people that he has consecrated for himself. A lot of time we do make a prayer and we say, Lord, Lord, use me. But that's not the prayer. God is, you know, interested and looking for vessels that he can use. That's our God. You know, at times we pray and we make as if God really wants people to beg him to use them. No, no, no. God is looking for vessels. God is looking for men. God is looking for women. But he's struggling to find them because they have not set themselves apart for his service. Remember in Ezekiel, the Lord, uh, God tells Ezekiel, I have sought a man to stand in the gap, but I found none. So it is in the nature of God, always looking for people that he may use. God is looking for you. Is looking for me to, you know, to be vessels that he can use. But what hinders God or what enables God to use one and not uh, use the other is just being, number one, available. There are people who are totally not available for God. And number two is the issue of setting yourself aside. Saying, do you know what? I'm living my life for the one who chose to die for, uh, the one who gave his life to die on the cross for me. Consecration means set apart, set to be holy. So God tells Moses, I want you to set apart Aaron 
and his sons. Why? Because he wants to use them as priests. And many times when I've said, when we pray, God, use me. That's not the prayer that we should be praying. Why? Because God is looking for vessels to use. God is looking for you to use you as a vessel. Remember the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and he says, in, in the house there are many vessels, some of noble use and others of ignoble use. But if you purge yourself, you shall become a vessel of honor, ready for the service of God. So, you know, God wants to use vessels. God wants to use men. God wants to use women. He wants priests for his name's sake. But listen, God does not use people who are not set apart from him, for him. I pray today by the grace of God that you shall have the need, you know, and the desire to say, you know what, I'm setting myself aside for God to use me. And then, um, then he says, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brothers, for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, who may have filled with the spirit of wisdom. So he says, number one, these people are going to be set aside. Number two, they're going to be given holy garments. They're going to, you know, Moses is going to command that, uh, that you know, holy garments be made for Aaron and his sons. Remember that in the, in the, in the Old Testament, this was a very big issue. And so, so it should be supposed to be also a big issue because I don't believe any person who desires to use God can just go and dress anyhow. You know, we are re representatives of God and we should be honorable in our dressing and all that. But what is more important before the eyes of God is that you have been set aside, number one, and you have worn the clothes of righteousness. And when you talk about righteousness, we're not talking about religious do's and don'ts. You're talking about the righteousness that is provided to you and me as believers through the finished work of Christ on the cross. Because our own righteousness, the Bible says, it is filthy rags before God. So above all, in addition to your dressing, before your dressing, sorry, before you figure out about your dressing and you say, you know, this is what I'm going to dress, this is what I'm going to dress, make sure that you are walking in the righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ has provided in your life. And how do you do this? By believing that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, that by being washed by His blood, you're standing rightly with God because that's what righteousness means. It means a right standing with God. So the clothes that they were wearing, they were clothes to signify that this is a priest. And when you're looking at a priest, you'll know that this is a person who's rightly standing with God. Because that's what priests were. Because priests were representatives of God to the people, and they represented the people unto God. So a priest signified a man under the heavens who is a representative of God to the people, and a representative of the people unto God. And so in our days, we are also royal priesthoods. We are a holy nation. We are set apart. And we ought to walk and be clothed in righteousness. And when you talk about righteousness, again I repeat, it is a right standing with God. This is the question. Are you rightly standing with God? Have you worn your clothes of garments of righteousness? That the righteous Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to give us. You know the scripture says what? That the righteous died for the unrighteous so that the unrighteous can have fellowship with the Holy Father. That's all the scripture is all about. Christ did not just die on the cross for no reason. He died on the cross that me and you can have a right standing with God. Second, the third thing he says here, God says, uh, and now I've commanded skillful artisans of whom I have put my spirit upon them. You see, people think that the spirit of God is just about preaching. It's more than preaching. The Holy Spirit is present to advance your skill. You know, a lot of people are skilled, but it is an advantage when the spirit of God is in your life. When the supernatural touches the natural, 
it becomes spectacular. It becomes standing out. And it is my prayer today, the gifts that you have, the talents that you have, as a believer, you have an, a, a competitive advantage in that the Holy Spirit, when he touches what looks like common, he makes it uncommon in your life. And I want to pray that every one of us, in whatever area of life we, you are in, you could be a businessman, you could be a teacher, you could be an athlete, you know, you could be an advisor, uh, wh whatever your profession is, whatever area of gifting you are in, let you make a prayer and say, Father, just fill me with the person of your Holy Spirit. Make what looks common to become uncommon. And you shall see that come into your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 5. They shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, artistically worked. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at its two edges, and so it shall be joined together, and the intricately woven, woven band of the ephod which is on it shall be on the same workmanship, made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone, in order of their birth with the work of an engraver in stone. Like the engraving of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in, in setting of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulder of the ephod as memorial stones of the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear the names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold, like braided cords, and fasten the braided chains to the settings. So this is the ephod. And uh, it was a piece of clothing that uh, you know God commanded that let there be precious stones that are put on the breastlets, 12 of them, representing each tribe of the children of Israel. Why does this happen? Because every time the priest enters the Holy of Holies, Whenever the priest is going before the presence of God, remember we said the work of a priest is to, is to represent men before God and to represent, you know, God before men. So every time the priest would go into the presence of God, he had the weight of the matter. He had the weight of the community. He had the weight of the nation on himself. And as he walked into the presence of God, he carried the, uh, the names of the tribes of Israel together with him. And that is our duty as believers. We are royal priesthood. Let us carry the weight of the society before the presence of God, the weight of your family into the presence of God, the weight you know, of your surrounding into the presence of God. Why? Because you are God's representative here on earth to fulfill his purpose. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do according to his good purposes. So God wants you and me to fulfill his purposes here on earth. And part of that purpose is to do what is to represent the society before him. Remember, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Praise be the name of the living God. And so as priests today, we cannot wear that ephod, but we have a ephod in our hearts. We should carry the hearts, you know, the, the needs of the saints and the needs of the people around us in intercession, in prayer, in supplication, and take them before the presence of God, not in arrogance, but with utmost humility to plead that God may move in this time and this generation. If there is something that is a heartbeat in my heart, is that I want to see an end time revival arising in our time. Praise be the name of the living God. And it is our responsibility to carry it on our knees, to pray, to fast, and to preach the authentic word of God. At such a time as this, 
Why? Because it is through God's word that he manifests himself. Remember what we said as we began in John chapter number 14, verses 21. He says, he who keeps my word is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me, my father shall come and shall also love him. And you know, and this person that my father loves, I shall come and manifest myself upon, upon their lives. It is my desire that we shall get back to God's word. And as we love it and keep his word in our hearts and we respond to him with a pure love. Because he said, you know, God has got a language. Every, you know, love has got a, love is a language. And we talk about the five languages of love. You know, uh, I was told, is it affection that those who understand love through affection, that those who understand through affirmation, through touch, and uh, can't remember the rest for now. And you know, there are those love languages. The love language of Christ is this. Keep my word. Obey it. By doing this, you have touched my heart. I know that you love me. And he says, if you love my word, then I have got no option, but I will come and manifest myself in your life. And that's why we are going through this word. We want to have an experience with God, but let it not be an experience of the word of God. Why? Because you can be easily deceived. But as you get into God's word and love God's word, then he shall come and manifest himself in your life. So if we get believers who are addicted to God's word, who keep God's law, who keep God's commandments, who treasure the holy writ as God has, has presented to us, who are obedient to the voice of God and constantly walking and doing what God has commanded us to do, I believe, saints, we shall see a revival like no other. Whatever laboring we are doing, it's not just a cliche. It is part of my desire to see an awakening come to our nation, an awakening come to this generation at such a time as this. Why? Because we have to get back to the word of God. We have to get back to the basics. Fall in love with the word of God. Keep his word and perform it. So it is in my heart a desire that God has laid. That's my effort. That's part of my effort, taking it before the presence of God, that we may see an awakening come into this nation and come to the nations of the earth at such a time as this. And I know that's not a burden alone in my heart. There are a lot of people praying, fasting, preaching, teaching, instructing. Why? Because we want to see an awakening in our generation. Because we are slowly getting a generation that is raising up that has never witnessed the acts of God. And it should not be so. I believe we have a responsibility to make God known in a unique manner in our days and in our times. You shall make the bracelet of judgment, verses 15, artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. And fine woven linen you shall make it. It shall be double it shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length, and a span by its width. And you shall put, and you shall put settings of stone in it, four rows of stone. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, and the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engraving of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the twelve tribes. You shall make chains for the breastplate at the end, like braided cords of pure gold. And you shall make two rings of the gold for the bracelet, for the bracelet and put the two rings on the two ends of the bracelet. Then you shall put the two braided chains of gold into rings, which are on the ends of the bracelet. And the other two ends of the two braided chains, you shall fasten to the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. 
You shall make two rings of gold and put them on two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the ephod. And two other rings of gold you shall make and put them on two shoulder straps underneath the ephod towards its front. Right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. They shall bind the bracelet by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod using a blue cord so that it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod and so and so that the bracelet does not come loose from the ephod. Verses 29. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the bracelet, on the breastplate of judgment over his heart, when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, which literally means lights and perfections. And they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord. So what does it mean? It means literally the lights and the perfections. That is Urim and Thurim upon his heart. So when you go before the presence of God, this should be our, our, our attitude. Urim and Thurim, lights and perfections. As you go before the presence of God, let your heart be perfect before him. For a perfect heart, God will not resist. A humble heart, God will not resist. Your attitude as you get into the presence of God means more than the words that you're going to speak. You may speak eloquently before God, but your heart is perfect. When you go before the presence of God, even to pray for people, don't go there with an attitude that, God, I am better than the person I'm praying to. That's not a perfect heart. Go there knowing that you are a creature of mercy. Go there knowing that you are there by the grace of God. Light and perfections. Verse 31. You shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. It shall have a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. And upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem. The bells of gold between them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sounds will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord. And when he comes out, uh, when he comes out that he may not die. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it uh, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And you shall put it on a blue cord that it may be on the turban. It shall, also, it shall be on the front of the turban. So it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall also be on his forehead that he may be accepted before the Lord. You shall sit skillfully with the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen, and you shall make the shash of wooden work. For Aaron's son, you shall make tunics, and you shall make uh, sashes for them, and you shall make the hats for them, for glory and beauty. For you shall put them on Aaron and your, your brother and his sons with him, shall anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them, that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and his sons. Uh, they shall be on Aaron and his sons when they come into the tabernacle of the meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him in the name of our Jesus Christ. So, a couple of things here, two major things, you know, arise here. And um, God tells Moses that part of the clothing that Aaron shall wear shall have a bell. And uh, the purpose of the bell is that whenever Aaron is ministering in the sanctuary, the holy place, 
that the bells will be ring, signifying that he's alive. And you know, there is said that if the bells stopped moving, it meant that the person who was ministering before the Lord has been struck dead. And you know, as you read it, you'll discover they had to tie a rope on one of his, re- of the, of his legs. So that in case the bells stop ringing, they'll know this person has been struck by the Lord. And they'll pull you, because no one else can enter into that place. They'll pull you out. And you know, it just signifies that you should always be alive in God's presence. Always be alive as you're walking around in the place. Let your heart be steady before God. Let your heart be always open before God. There is life when you enter before God. The presence of God. The second thing it says, uh, and it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things with the children of Israel hallow in their holy gifts. Now you see, Aaron was to, uh, you know, wear the burden of the sins of the children of Israel as he enters into the holy of holies. Now we are in the New Testament. Guess who has borne the iniquities? It is Jesus Christ. That's the beauty of this one. Jesus Christ has borne your iniquity. As he entered into the Holy of Holies, the book of Hebrews says, he entered this, the Holy of Holies with his own blood. Our sins were attributed to him. That we who have sinned may live for righteousness. That's the wonderful divine exchange nature of God. Praise be the name of the living God. Then um, uh, uh, God tells Moses, sanctify, consecrate these things, for this is what Aaron and his sons shall be wearing as they minister before me. God is also so particular in concern to what people dress as they minister. We cannot just dress anyhow as we come into the presence of God, as we minister before the presence of God. We need to look decent. Why? Because we are representing a decent God. But above all, our hearts need to be decent before God. For light and perfection should be our attitude as we come to serve and minister before God to the glory and the honor of His name. 29. And this is what you shall do to them to hallow them for, for ministering to me as priest. Take one bull. And two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring in the basket with the bull and the two rams. So here God is talking about consecrating Aaron and his sons. Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting, and you shall wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments, put the tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the breastplate, and guard, and guard him with the, intri- with the intricately woven band of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. And you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on him, and you shall guard them with sashes. Aaron and his sons, and put their hearts on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute, so you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. So the Bible says, uh, God tells uh, Moses, as you consecrate Aaron, number one, you shall wash them with water. You shall wash him with water and his sons. Remember, uh, you know, what in the, uh, in, in the Bible signifies the word of God. If you want to be set apart, If you want to be cleansed, study the word of God. Study the word of God. Why? It is the one that washes your mind. Not brainwashing. No, no, no. I'm not talking about brainwashing. It renews your thoughts. It renews the way you think. You begin to see the will of God. The purposes of God. Why? Because without reading his word, you'll never know how God wants you to serve. You'll never know what God wants. You'll never understand what his will is. So Moses is told, wash Aaron with water. Wash his sons with water. And if you want to be a servant of God, you must be addicted to his word. Why? Because there is no way you can serve God 
without knowing his will. I've seen people, you know, frustrated uh, when they are unemployment because they are trying to serve a boss or an owner of a company or their CEO or the immediate boss, yet they don't know what the expectation is. So you do this, uh, you know, you put this book here, uh, the boss comes and is frustrated. Why did you put it on my right? When, why didn't you put it in my left? So because you don't know what the boss expects, there are others who are just sadists, narcissists. If you put it on the right, he says, I want it on the right, left. If you put it tomorrow on the left, he says, I want it there in front. You know, just, you know, changing the goalposts. But that's not our God. God has put in his word the statutes, the nature, the will, the purpose, you know, the way he wants to be served. The way he wants us to walk with him. Remember Amos 3.3 3 says, How can two walk together unless they are in agreement? And how can you agree with God other than in his word? We agree with what God says so, excuse me, so that we can be able to walk with him. You shall also have the bull brought before the tabernacle of the meeting and Aaron and his sons shall, shall put their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. You shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the on of the altar, on the on of the altar with your finger, and pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that co- the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, and burn them on the altar by the flesh of the bull with its skin and its offal. You shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. You shall also take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it all around on the altar. Then you shall cut the ram in pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, and put them, and put them with its pieces and with its head. And you shall burn the old ram on the altar, it is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now here Aaron as a priest, he has to atone for his own sins. That's what the scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews, that listen, the Christ that we have, the priest that we have, yes, is not like Aaron. Why? Because, uh, you know, he did not have to atone for his own sin. For Aaron to stand as a priest, he had to atone. Of his own uh, sins. Verses 19. You shall also take the other ram. And Aaron and his sons shall put his hands on the head of the ram. Then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood. And put it on on the tip of the right ear of Aaron. And on the tip of the right ear of his sons. On the thumb of their right hand. And on the big toe of their right foot. And sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. And you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of their anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. And he and his garments shall be hallowed and his sons and his sons' garments with him. So he says, this other, you know, animal, you shall kill it and you shall take the blood, put it on the tip of his ear, put it on the tip of his finger and the tip of his of his toe. What does this signify? It signifies the ear to he, listen to God. Your ears must be sanctified. You cannot just go on listening to everything and expect to be, you know, uh, to be familiar with God's voice. No, no, no. Your ears need to be consecrated. You can't just listen to any kind of music, music and expect to hear the voice of God. A lot of worship leaders have entangled themselves with all kinds of, you know, songs in the in the in the name of finding a good tune, a good beat. But if your ears are not set aside to listen to what, you know, what is appropriate, you remember Saul? He had to take David to play the harp. And music so melodious in the presence of Saul was tormented by the demons. And as soon as Saul would hear that, his spirit will be set free. Some of us, we've had a lot of boom, bap, twaf, 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 all week long. And we want to come in the presence of God on Sunday. 
Lift up holy hands before him and expect to listen and hear from him. And many people get frustrated and they walk outside the house of God and they say, I didn't hear God speak to me. Why? Because your ears are not set towards what God wants you to hear. Listen to good worship music. Let your hearts be tender. When you listen to good, that's what I do. At times I even, before I get to pray, just set good music. Just listen to the world. Worship together with those people who are singing. And my heart begins to be open before the presence of God. And I begin to hear what he has to say, to say into my life or speak into my life. Then he says, the blood he shall put on the ear and on the tip of his finger. Why? Because your hands are to serve him. Your hands cannot just touch anything. You cannot just be everywhere and expect God to use your hands. Remember, your hands are the extension of the hands of Jesus. If you touch the sick, the sick are touched by the hands of Jesus. They are the extension of the hands of Christ. And your toes, wherever you go, let your toes be sanctified before God. The Bible talks about in the book of Psalms and it says, Blessed is the man who does not stand in the way of the sinners. Who um, does not walk in the way of sin, sinners, stand in the ways of those who are scornful. You cannot just be in any company and expect God to use you. Remember, we are in this world, but you are not of this world. You are a child of God. You are a royal priesthood. Carry the kingdom of God wherever you go in Jesus' name. Verses 22. Also you shall take the fat of the ram, the fat of the tail, the fat that covers the entrance, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, the two kidneys and the fat on them, the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration, one loaf of bread and cake and make it with oil, and one wafer from the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you shall put all this in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall receive them back, you shall receive them back from their hands and burn them on the altar as a burnt offering, a sweet aroma before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire to the Lord. Then you shall take the breast of uh, uh, the breast of, of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord. And it shall be your portion, and from the ram of your consecration you shall consecrate the breast, the breast of the wave offering, which is waved and the thigh of the Eve offering which is raised, of that which is of Aaron, and of that which is of his sons. It shall be from the children of Israel, for Aaron and his sons by a statutes forever. For it is a heave, it is a heave offering, it shall be a heave offering from the children of Israel, from the sacrifices of the peace offering, that is their eve offering to the Lord. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them. That son, that son who becomes priest in his place shall put them on, on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of the meet, meeting to minister in the holy places, 31. And you shall take the arm of the consecration of the boil and, and boil its flesh in the holy place. Then Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. They shall eat those things with which the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. By an, by an outsider, but an outsider shall not eat them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh of the consecration offerings or of the bread remains until the morning, they shall, they shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. It's like they are having a holy communion in the presence of God. Thus you shall do to Aaron and his sons according to all that I have commanded you. Seven days you shall consecrate them, and you shall and you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for, for atonement. You shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar must be holy. So God says you shall consecrate for seven good days, making an, an atonement and anointing it with oil to set it aside. That's how serious God is because he is a holy God. Verses 38. 
Now this is what you shall offer on the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a in of pressed oil, and one-fourth of a in of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamp you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer with it the grain offering and the drink offering as an as as in the morning, as in the morning for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you, where I will meet you to speak with you. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Praise be the name of the living God. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of the meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell amongst the children of Israel and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. That I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Praise be the name of the living God. So God tells uh, Moses, consecrate these things. Consecrate Aaron and his sons because I want to use them. I want, you know, them to serve before me. And as they serve before me, guess what? I will make my presence manifest in the children of Israel and they shall know me as their God. Why does God do this? Because he wants to make a distinction with this nation that he's establishing. God's presence brings distinction in our life. But for God's presence, his manifest presence, to be experienced in our lives, we must live lives that are consecrated before him. Remember, God is holy. And he says, as you consecrate these things, they shall be holy before me. It is my prayer today, as we come into, uh, into this, you know, the end of these days reading. That if there is anything that will be beaten in your heart, is the desire to be set aside for God. Let the refiner's fire refine you. Let your heart's one desire be to be holy. Set apart for him who is your master. A perfect heart before God is what he says. God is so interested in your attitude even more than in your actions. If your actions are right and your attitudes are wrong, God will give you an opportunity. But if your act attitude is right, they will inspire the right actions on your part. If your attitude is right, then your giving will be right. If your attitude is right, then your prayer will be right. If your attitude is right, then your service before God will be Praise be the name of the living God. I am so excited that we've come to the end of this day and the reading of his word. It is my prayer and my desire that we will desire to live just lives that are set apart for the glory of God. Can we pray? Father, we thank you and we honor you today. We thank you for the opportunity just to look into your word. Lord, one thing has come out clearly. Consecration, consecration consecration. Being set apart for your work and for your service. Lord, we know you desire to use a lot of us. When we are praying, saying, Lord, use me. You are searching for a man and a woman to use. It is my prayer today that some of us will change the way we pray and say, Lord, I know you want to use me. Show me how to set myself apart. Set myself apart for the glory and the honor of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we do trust, pray, and believe it. Amen, amen. For giving, the information is right there on our screens. Uh, feel free to give your tithe, your offering, your love gift, uh, or as the Lord leads you. And as you do that, I believe that the blessings of a giver will rest of in your life. If you want to be a partner to this ministry, this information that is that has run on your screen, use this information 
call us. Let us know that you want to be a partner in this ministry. Let's meet again tomorrow, same time, same place. May God keep you in perfect peace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you so much.